Hi folks, it's Friday the 12th of February and as I speak we've vaccinated about 14 million people now across the whole of the UK. Uh, that's the first jab for 14 million people. It looks like we are on target. We very much hope to reach the, uh, the JCVI, the, the most vulnerable groups, one to four, uh, by the 15th. And uh, obviously there's a lot of work going on to make sure that we, we do that. And I want to thank again everybody involved, the vaccinators, the, the NHS staff, all the army uh, personnel who are helping, uh, the pharmacists, the volunteers, the council officials, many, many council workers doing fantastic work on the vaccine programme. Thank you all. We couldn't do it without you. I was up at uh, Derby seeing the incredible work being done by the vaccination centre there, where they're really going gangbusters. I mean, shooting the lights out. I think they're, they're ahead of uh, target uh, in terms of vaccinating the groups that they have to do. And people are working uh, absolutely flat out in spite of the weather conditions at the All Woodley Medical Centre in Leeds. They had to dig, uh, dig, out a, dig people out of a snowdrift or dig the whole thing out of a snowdrift uh, in order uh, to keep going and do 1,200 vaccinations uh, per day. That's the kind of dedication that we're, we're seeing. Thanks to, to all of them. But I really want to thank all of you, everybody who's coming forward to get vaccinated. It's very, very important that you do so, but uh, there are still a few people, still uh, a million or more, who have not yet uh, come forward to get your vaccinations in this group. Please do so. It's very, very easy. Just contact your GP, reply to the, to the letter, which you should have got uh, by now, or just, uh, just ring uh, 119. The peak we had um, uh, back in April last year we had about 18,000 people in the NHS. Uh, we currently, as of yesterday, have over 30,000 people in the NHS. Uh, and um, a week ago, uh, all the four chief medical officers for England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland said, this is going to be a significant crisis for the NHS unless we take evasive action. And this new variant is really pushing things uh, in a way that the old variant, which was already very bad, uh, was not able to. So we have a very significant problem. Uh, here in London, for example, one in 30 people currently have this coronavirus, according to the Office of National Statistics. Across the country as a whole, it's one in 50. So this is a serious problem and it's rising in every part of England. So what we need to do, because uh, the next few weeks are going to be uh, the worst weeks of this pandemic in terms of numbers into the NHS, uh, what we need to do before the vaccines have had their effect, because it's going to take several weeks before that happens, is we need to really double down. This is everybody's problem. Any single unnecessary contact you have with someone uh, is a potential link in a chain of transmission that will lead to a vulnerability. We're going to bring you right up to date with our breaking story this hour, that announcement that trials carried out by the US pharmaceutical giant Pfizer and the German manufacturer BioNTech suggest they have created a coronavirus vaccine which is more than 90% effective. Our health correspondent Anna Collinson joins me now. Anna, we've been hearing uh, from the CEO of Pfizer saying this is a great day for science and humanity and a significant step forward. It feels that way, is it? Yes, definitely. It, de it definitely feels like a huge milestone. You know, with, with these vaccines, they're one of the greatest tools that we have to get out of the lockdown restrictions that some of us are living in, the social distancing, not being able to see our loved ones. The vaccines are seen as a tool to help us get there. And this is a huge moment. We have to stop the spread of COVID. To do this, we all need to work together. We need to limit our movements. We need to consider whenever we leave our house that anyone with us, anyone we come into contact with, could co convey the virus. So whilst it is in human nature to engage in conversation with others, to be friendly, um, unfortunately, this is not the time to do that. So even if you run into your next door neighbour in the shopping centre, in the Coles, while you're at Coles Woolworths or Aldi or any other um, grocery shop, don't start up a conversation. Now is the time for minimising your interactions with others. Even if you've got a mask, do not think that affords total protection. We want to be absolutely sure that as we go about our daily lives, we do not come into contact 
with anyone else that would pose a risk. Obviously, people have... There are essential work. There is work, and I shouldn't use that term essential. I understand that work is essential to everyone and probably you need a new word other than essential. But I think the community understands what we mean. We need to maintain our food services, logistics supply. We need um, hospitals to, and health services to be operating. But now is the time to really ensure that everyone complies with the spirit and intent. And the spirit and in intent of the public health orders is to reduce mobility, reduce the opportunities for anyone to come into contact with anyone else. And so that responsibility is now firmly on workplaces to take those actions. And clearly we have seen the closure of a number of workplaces which facilitates that as well. And finally, another action I want to make it clear is permitted under these um, lockdown provisions is going out and getting a vaccine. You shouldn't go if, you've been, if you're a close contact or, you, or you've been designated as a casual contact, but please go and get vaccinated. Um, we, there is access to vaccines and the vaccines are incredibly effective at preventing hospitalisation and death. And they are, the, they, they are the way out. And yes, we haven't got enough vaccine at the moment, but we have got some vaccine which is accessible and I would urge everyone to go forward for your second dose of AstraZeneca or also your first dose or if you're eligible for Pfizer to take up that opportunity. Thank you. I also want to take a moment to address the current situation with COVID-19. This morning, Canadians woke up to very encouraging news from Pfizer and BioNTech about their vaccine candidate. Canada signed a deal with them in August to secure millions of doses. At the same time, we're also seeing other vaccine candidates progressing well. In Canada and around the world, scientists are working very hard and doing a great job. We hope to see vaccines landing in the early next year. But between now and then, it's really, really important that we double down on our efforts. We need to make sure we are controlling the spread of COVID-19 in the coming months so that when vaccines get here, we will be able to act quickly to protect all Canadians. And to be very clear, if you catch COVID in the coming days and weeks, a vaccine won't help you or your family. We see the light at the end of the tunnel. We are hopeful we are getting there because our scientists are working incredibly hard. But we need to do our part. We need to stay strong and hang in there a few more months. Maybe more than that, but we can see it coming. So download the COVID Alert app. Keep your distances. Reduce your gatherings to essential members of your family. And follow local public health advice. That's how we'll get through this winter to a spring and a summer that will be much better. Extra powers for work sites, but we, we keep getting told households, the big problem, are you going to be going suburb to suburb, street to street, door to door, knocking on these and actively looking for people who are in the wrong house and finding them on the spot? Yeah, look, absolutely. Overnight we conducted hundreds of checks, particularly of those who were close contacts or who have the virus. Thankfully, everyone was home as they were supposed to be on health advice. We'll continue to do that. We know home-to-home -home transmission is a huge issue for us. We know that people are bringing it home from work sites that aren't complying with health orders. So if you think about the powers that I've asked for, it will take it to those businesses that are breaching the health orders and it will take it back to the homes that are continuing to breach the health orders that are putting us into an extended lockdown. For breaking news, turn to Peter Overton, nightly at six. Uh, Mr. Ferguson is a... Professor Ferguson is a, is a very, very eminent and impressive scientist. Uh, and um, his, the science that he's done has been an important part of what we've listened to. But clearly, the, the social distancing rules are there for everyone. And they're incredibly important and they're deadly serious. Uh, and the reason is because they're the means by which we've managed to get control of this virus. It's a matter for the police. As a government minister, I'm not allowed to get involved in the operational decisions of police matters. 
even though I've got a clear answer to what I think, uh, it's as a, as a minister, the way we run the police is that they make decisions like this. Uh, but I think he took the right decision to resign. Professor Ferguson has rightly now taken the, the decision he's did and, and said that there is no reason and he should have upheld and followed the rules on, on social distancing. The work of SAGE, our scientific advisory group, uh, continues and obviously we will continue to be informed by that group and the experts that uh, provide that support to the government. It's a very strange concept to have a Barbie doll created in my likeness. I hope it will be part of making it more normal for girls to think about careers in science. I think it's important to show girls and young women what options there are available to them, because if you don't know what there is out there, then it's not a career that you're going to take up. I've been designing vaccines for a while now. We had a large team of people all working flat out until we finally knew we had a vaccine that would protect people against coronavirus. For me, the benefits of a career in STEM is just continually being able to learn new things. It's a really interesting area to work in. You can learn about the way biology works, about the way the world works, and then use that to help people and protect their health. I think it is important to know that everybody can achieve what they want to in life. It's great to have a very diverse team. We need lots of different people working together to make a success, and that's what we had in our vaccine team last year. I know that my friends and family will be extremely amused to know that there's now a Barbie doll in my image. I think I'll probably keep it in my office at work, um, along with some other trophies from 2020 and 2021. Um, it, is, it is a... Um, um an ignorance of medical fact. Um, and if you don't understand it, um, it's very uh, it's very easy to mistrust it. After all, you're dealing with something precious. You're dealing with your own body, your own life, and you wish to protect that, quite right too. And if you don't understand what actually a, a vaccination does, and to some degree how it does it, um, then you'll say, keep off me. Um, and if there are, if people who, who say that and then get the upper hand in, 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 in trying to persuade people and, and frightening people who don't understand, then you're in a serious situation. But fortunately, it seems to me that more and more people are understanding what this is. And the majority, I'm sure, of the population understands perfectly well that this is uh, an a great triumph of medicine that we are able we understand the nature of these kinds of diseases and how to guard against them by mobilizing nature's own protection you can all see the enthusiasm of millions of young people to get their jabs we need even more young adults to receive a protection that is of immense benefit to your family and friends and to yourselves. And so I would remind everybody that some of life's most important pleasures and opportunities are likely uh, to be increasingly dependent on vaccination. I should serve notice now that by the end of September, when all over 18s will have had their chance to be double jabbed, we're planning to make full vaccination the condition of entry to nightclubs and other venues where large crowds gather. Proof of a negative test will no longer be enough. We want people to be able to take back their freedoms as they can today. We want this country to be able to enjoy the fruits of our massive efforts and of our enormous vaccination campaign. But to do that, we must remain cautious and we must continue to get vaccinated. And that's why we're asking you to come forward and get your jabs. To say that I am fuming about the actions of this individual is an absolute understatement. The selfish actions of this individual have put uh, our whole state in a very difficult situation. One of the close contacts linked to the Woodville Pizza Bar deliberately misled our contact tracing team. Their story didn't add up. We pursued them. We now know that they lied. I stress this point 
that this is still a very dangerous cluster and our expert health, uh, our health experts remain extremely concerned. We need to find and isolate a whole new group of associates. We are still urging South Australians to get tested. But just as we have acted immediately to put restrictions in place to keep South Australians safe... The, the number of cases of coronavirus are rising. Yesterday, we saw 3,542 new cases, the highest since the 12th of April. The variant first identified in India, so-called B1617.2, is still spreading. And the latest estimates are that more than half, and potentially as many as three quarters of all new cases, are now of this variant. Now, as we set out our roadmap, we always expected cases to rise. We must remain vigilant. The aim, of course, is to break the link to hospitalizations and deaths so that cases alone no longer require stringent restrictions on people's lives. The critical thing to watch is the link from the number of cases to how many people end up in hospital. The increase in cases remains focused in hotspots, and we're doing all we can to tackle this variant. Well, I'm here today to see our plan for jobs in action. One of the most significant interventions we put in place was the furlough scheme, and I was determined to protect as many people's jobs as possible, and it's clear that that's worked. Talking to people here today, they're excited to be back at work, from furlough and across the country from a peak of nine million people that were furloughed we're now down to one in ten of the workforce uh, that are still on furlough but i want to see as many of those people back i know they are all itching to get back to work as well as we're talking to people here today prove that point and that's why i've provided up to nine billion pounds to support companies through the jobs retention bonus to help bring those remaining employees back to work it's clear that the furlough scheme has worked in protecting millions of people's of jobs. But as the numbers today show, I wouldn't be being honest with people if I pretended that it was always going to be possible for people to return to the job that they had. Now, in terms of helping those people, I don't think the right thing to do is to endlessly extend furlough. As you can see talking to people here today, people don't want to be at home, they want to be in work. And that's why our plan for jobs is so important because it helps provide people with new opportunities going forward. But protecting people's jobs, creating new jobs remains top of my mind and I'm always looking for interesting, creative, innovative and effective new ways to support jobs and employment and people can rest assured that that will remain my number one priority. No, I think the first thing is that you, we have been, as a country, hugely successful with uh, vaccinations. Uh, but the one area where I think we just need to do more collectively is get more young people coming forward. And that's why I'm here at this fantastic vaccination centre today here in northwest London, where they're making a huge effort in getting more young people through the door, especially that age group of 18 to 29. And what I would say uh, to that group of people is, Please get vaccinated for your own benefit, for your loved ones, but for your wider community. Uh, but as the Prime Minister has said, uh, when it comes to, for example, nightclubs, uh, by the end of September, we've picked September because everyone would have had the chance by then, every adult, to have a double vaccination, that you will need uh, to prove your vaccination status. And, and for young people, they should think of vaccines as being liberating. You know, uh, let's get, we, everyone wants to see a return to normal. We're on that journey uh, to normal and we're doing it because of the vaccines. But for young people who want to travel, you know, for example, as well, you know, it's really helps you to get vaccinated. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the way things are heading. And, and, and those young people who want those vaccines, they can get them right here and now across the country, including in fantastic pop-up centres.
Well, I've just walked up and there are queues going all the way down the road, around the block, all the way to the station. It's fantastic to see so many young Londoners queuing up to receive the jab. Across London today, we've got a number of mass vaccination centres. I want to say thank you to Chelsea, to West Ham, to Charlton. Spurs will open tomorrow, Arsenal later on this week. But any Londoner uh, can simply turn up to have the jab across London. You don't need to know your NHS number. You don't need to be registered with a jab. As long as you've got an arm, you can get a jab. It can take 10 to 15 years for a vaccine to reach the clinic. Our personal best as a species is around a third of that. Faced with the biggest pandemic in a century, we hope to smash the record. Recognising the threat from pandemics, Oxford researchers started working on how to deliver a vaccine against a so far unknown disease X. We'd already run clinical trials on that delivery mechanism, in fact with another kind of coronavirus. That trial data meant we could move quickly into early phases of the COVID-19 vaccine trial since we knew how to make a vaccine that should work. Ideally, we'd need a factory on site to make the vaccine quickly for trials. And, happily, we did. We screened volunteers before we knew human trials would start, so that we could start testing the vaccine in humans the next day after safety data were published. And we'd need commercial partners ready to make the vaccine if it was shown to work. In fact, before it's shown to work, so we have it in large quantities ready if we find it's effective. We'd need regulators and funders to make us their top priority, to review our work and fund it, and they did. It's still complex work, and the science takes as long as it needs to take. But by throwing all our resources at the problem, and running stages of development in parallel, we've made it as fast as it could possibly be this time. And we're not on our own. We're one of dozens of such trials, as well as treatments, public health interventions, the works. We're not in a race against other researchers, we're racing a virus. And however long that takes, we aim to win. Your friends, family, colleagues, classmates, and anyone else you come into contact with, even strangers, could be put in danger if you turn down the vaccine. It's not just a decision that affects you. It's OK to have questions about the COVID vaccine. That's normal. It's good to talk about them, though, with your doctor or community leaders or even friends and family you trust who have received the vaccine already. Vaccines have been tested rigorously and they've been found to be safe and to prevent people from developing symptoms and getting seriously ill with COVID-19. But now we're starting to see research which suggests a vaccine can prevent people from spreading the virus too. You're vaccinated and your friends and colleagues are vaccinated. That will substantially reduce the, the risk for everybody. That makes sense. If you're not coughing or sneezing, then it's harder to pass the virus on. If we spread less COVID-19, fewer people get sick and the pandemic will be over sooner. So the current thinking is, if you choose to get the vaccine, you're choosing to look after yourself and everyone you come into contact with. If you don't, then you and those people won't have that protection. But scientists say they need to gather more data on this issue before we can be certain that vaccines reduce transmission. But even if it turns out to be true, if too many people don't get their shot, then that makes it easier for the virus to find a way to spread, meaning more people will get ill and die. And if it turns out the vaccine doesn't stop you from spreading the virus, then it's even more important that everyone gets their shots. There is only one victor in a world where a vaccine haves and vaccine have nots, the virus itself. NHS COVID pass for use at venues and events in England. If you haven't already, you will need to download the NHS app to your smartphone. This is not to be confused with the NHS COVID-19 app. You will need a mobile phone number and your date of birth to set up an NHS login to see your vaccination or test results. To open the NHS app when you have downloaded it, press the app icon which takes you to the home screen. Press continue with the NHS login button. You will need to enter your email address, then press continue. You will be prompted for your password. Enter this and press continue. Once you have set up your login with your ID, at this stage you will arrive at a security code page. You will be sent a text with a six digit code. Enter this and press continue. OK, you are now ready to click on the Get Your NHS COVID Pass. Click continue, then the screen gives you a choice of domestic or travel. You will need to click on the domestic link. 
it should show a green tick and say valid in England. Please have this information ready on your phone as you approach the event to show your vaccination status or negative test results to a member of the venue or event team if you are asked to show this. If you don't have access to a computer or smartphone and have been fully vaccinated, you can call 119 for a copy of the NHS COVID Pass letter. The letter can take up to five working days to reach you, so ensure you order it in good time before your event. You can also download and print a PDF version of the letter through www.nhs.uk. If you have any further questions, visit www.nhs.uk or call 119 and select NHS COVID Pass Service. They're here. Digital vaccine passports are rolling out for healthcare workers in the north of England. It's the work of British company V Health Passport. What's the advantage of having this digitally? Why not just give everyone a piece of paper? People are starting to sell fake COVID passports so they can go on air airlines. They're using the V code because it is end to end secure. It ensures that none of these uh, certificates, either paper or digital, can be forged. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. They're far from alone. IBM, Microsoft, even the Danish government are all working on their own versions of a digital vaccine passport to reopen borders and allow people to travel without quarantine. Hi, Gareth Southgate here. Just firstly wanted to say thank you for the support you gave the team this summer. Um, but also to say, look, we know the last 18 months have been incredibly difficult for everybody. And there's no doubt that the vaccination program is our best route out of this problem, not only for us as a country, but across the world. So just wanted to say how important it is if you haven't had your vaccine yet to go and get it done. Um, I know oldies like me have had both jabs, so we can crack on with our lives, but for your younger ones especially, the chance for everything to open up, to get your freedom back, um, so much of that is going to rest on you having the vaccine. So don't put it off any longer. Go and get it done. We can open everything up. We can protect the people we need to protect and you guys will get your freedom back. The rhythm of life. Ah, oh, yes. I can picture it now. And the rhythm of life is a powerful beat. Puts a tingle in your fingers and a tingle in your feet. Rhythm in your bedroom, rhythm in the street. Yeah, the rhythm of life is a powerful I've had mine. I look fantastic! Rhythm of life is a powerful beat. It's a tingle in your fingers and a tingle in your feet. Rhythm in the bedroom, rhythm in the street. It's the rhythm of life is a powerful beat. To feel the rhythm of life. To feel that powerful beat. To feel the tingle in your fingers. To feel the tingle in your feet. Just get a vaccination. Every vaccine gives us hope, and two vaccinations are the best way to protect yourself and others. Join the millions and please play your part in getting us back to the rhythm of life.
Evening, Christian. Evening, Spook. How we diddling? All right, we said. Can everyone hear us all right? I'm not going to try and keep up with this chat because it's going about a million miles an hour. No, I don't look at it you just get distracted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is going a million miles an hour. All right, clap close. Crab Claws is in, Amish is in, anti covid's in, Eye for an Eye's in, Lorraine's in. It's just going too quick, man. Johnny Fogg's in. Hog the Munchin. Catherine Amblin. Yeah, anyway. Ross Holt. Yeah, let's move on because uh, sorry if I've missed your name out there. I hope you can hear us all right. Rude. Loud and clear. So, welcome to Sheep Farm Raw live stream. Uh, thanks, fellow creator traitors, uh, for tuning into this bullshit platform on a lovely summer's drought evening that's actually pissing down here <laughs> in Yorkshire. <laughs> Is that a better shot or open fire? Uh, I don't know. I, I prefer, either way, I just prefer that than your armpit. <laughs> it goes a bit bright, it goes a bit weird. And tonight we're on episode 134. Uh, this is going to be Who Checks the Fact Checkers? Who Checks the Fact Checkers? With me tonight, as usual, is our binocular nostrils. He's been out in his allotment uh, today, growing his uh, mango for his gunga rice, <laughs> gunga rice and pea. Um, <laughs> what, which piss are you drinking tonight? <clears throat> I've got a bottle of Governor. Remember someone recommended it? Yeah. Oh, I, I already remember. drank it, but... Right, I just, I just bought twelve bottles from. Uh... Twelve bottles. Yeah, how long did that last you? Two days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I hate, to, I hate to think of those French people squashing them grapes with the toes. <laughs> how many bottles are going to make for you? Uh, sorry about that initial video there. Uh, they don't forget the uh, don't don't believe the Matrix uh, video. Uh, we have to go through it. You should have seen me trying to put it together. Uh, you just want to head back <laughs> telly. I know Mark Bajerski was uh, ready for He's probably gone out now kicking cats and stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're all right, Mark. I hope we've recovered. It is hard watching that, isn't it? It is very it's very hard. hard. I mean, if you think about that's like 0.001% of all the nonsense that they're pumped out uh, across every platform, not just in the UK, but across the world. And that was a 30 minute segment of of that um and imagine how much effort they put in to come millions you. millions and millions of our pounds <laughs> yeah well millions of but more, more man hours and effort and energy that they've just drained um out of people it's uh well, sam carno's in as well just a force force for yeah. to do something that they didn't really want to do yeah yeah uh, no majority of people didn't want to do it that's why they had to put that much effort in Right up to point, what do you think about that? them videos? Uh, especially the last one, that musical. Uh, mm. Tingling your feet, tingling your toes. Mm. Is that With some blue, blue angel dust thrown into into the mix. Mm. Is that coincidental, do you think? Uh, yeah, of course, it's all a coincidence. I mean, does Jim Broadbent know what he was doing there? Was he a paid-up signed member, or was he just going along like everybody else, just hoping for the best, just being, you know, I think he would do his part. Same as that football guy, there's a football guy there as well, isn't there? Jonathan Southgate, foot, yeah. England football manager. Oh, yeah, is he manager? I mean, he's about as bright as an eclipse, isn't he? So, I don't know. Um, I've never seen him before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like talking to you about sport. <laughs> Take, bring, brings you back down to earth. But I, did, I don't know. Did, did most people, did my neighbours know what they were doing? And yet, I've just been talking to somebody whose grandfather just had a, had a stroke, you know? And he's now, he's been in hospital 16 weeks incontinent, having to be moved to a home. You know, a really active guy in Hollywood. Didn't used to show up. And, and right. these are the stories that we're, we're hearing now about, you know, after this, the fallout of all this um, nonsense. And the fact checkers were right in the middle of it. Uh, yeah. Just before we start, uh, all the Mark Devlin Second Summer of Love are on sheepfarm.co.uk and on Podomatic, who have distributed them to Spotify, Amazon, Audible, um, and all the, and Google, and, and all the other, and Apple, um, and a few other distribution uh, podcast uh, sites as well. There'll be no podcast this week, but I will put this live stream on the website, edited down, just the audio. Um, I'd like to thank as well uh, a couple of people for doing a couple of memes. Uh, I'll put this one up here. Future Ghost 
did this one. Revenge of the Nerds said it were inspired by that uh, presentation that we did about 18 months ago on Rise Above, which I'm just rewriting, actually. I'm just uh, tidying it up. Uh, so that's a good one with uh, all these people. <laughs> uh, also, um, Anticoviet did Only Pans. Uh, <laughs> we all know about Jacko's uh, OnlyFans account. Uh, we've got OnlyPans. Apparently, OnlyPans does exist. What, is it a pan company? Yeah. I right. hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I'm kind of a thing. <laughs> yeah. Right, let's move on. Uh, so thanks for Future Ghost and Anticovia for, for that. And uh, that's about it. Oh, yeah, you've been doing some new sheep art as well. Uh, you did this one the other day. Uh, Greta Thunberg as a new uh, character. Yeah. What's it called? I'm trying Thund- to, I'm, Thunderberg. Thunderberg. I'm, I'm trying to do... Um, <clears throat> I just just as an angle, uh, comic book covers, like they look like vintage comic book covers. But it's quite it's quite good fun, and I'm gonna do uh, can do can do all bitch tits can do a lot of them. Yeah, we get them all done bitch tits. I suppose that's yeah. another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super shit passing around. Yeah, <laughs> cool in the gang. Right, let's get this uh, presentation up sheep, here. I'm wearing a sheet farm merch as well. Inspired by the 1989 Batman time. <laughs> right, so who checks the checkers? Um, having you know, spent all that time on that Huxley uh, Brave New World Order research, it struck me that we should probably include the news, uh, especially uh, after that three-part Mockingbird series uh, with George Orwell, where well, the last one will be out next month about his George Orwell's bloodline, which probably will be another two or three hour one. Um, as we know, Orwell worked in the information research department, which looks very, very similar to what the BBC are doing now with this Mariana Spring. Um, and I'm going to play uh, that Mariana Spring uh, video just to get us in the mood for this uh, nonsense. of investigative journalists here at the BBC. Uh, We are also a new brand and we are a physical location um, above the newsroom in London. Um, And the point of the team, as you said, is to verify video, to fact check, to counter disinformation um, and to analyse really complex stories so we can get to the truth of what's going on. Why does this matter? Well, mistruths can cause really serious harm to society and to the people in them. And so we want to show you our workings and really help you understand how we get to the bottom of what's happening. And I'm gonna give you a bit of a flavor of the kind of work that the team are doing. Uh, So we're able to look at maps to geolocate um, specific uh, situations, stuff that's going on. And this is just a map of central London where we are now. And this is New Broadcasting House where I'm speaking to you from. Um, And it's not so important perhaps for the centre of London, but it is when we're analysing war zones or what's happening in hard to reach places. And there's a story on the BBC website today. It's looking at Russian fortifications um, on the front lines in Ukraine. uh, And you can read more about it there. Um, And there are other ways that we also are able to interrogate what's going on, including on social media. Um, I have some undercover accounts that I've set up for the BBC's Americas podcast. And we use these kinds of undercover accounts. And these are the characters that the accounts uh, are, uh, belong to, um, uh, to be able to really understand polarisation online and how um, what's happening on our social media feeds and what we're being recommended and pushed to us can affect all of us. Um, and they don't offer us a totally um, exhaustive insight into what's going on, but they can help us understand just how social media works. Um, and then there's also investigating uh, other mistruths and the real world harm they can cause. Um, at the moment, I'm investigating the UK's conspiracy theory movement. I'm trying to understand more about how it's evolved and intensified since uh, the pandemic here in the UK. I'm looking at the alternative media that finds itself at the heart of this movement and a conspiracy theory newspaper that's a part of that as well. I'm looking at the way that alternative media is funded. I'm looking at its impact on local communities. I'm looking at its connections with far right figures and also its foreign links. Um, That's for a podcast series that will be coming out in June. It's called Mariana in Conspiracy Land uh, and it will be available on BBC Sounds Radio 4 asking that question, could January the 6th or uh, German coup attempt like we saw um, there ever happen here. <laughs> Do you know you're part of a conspiracy <clears throat> movement, Chris? Oh, good. And why don't she tra- and all you traitors? Why don't she fact check um, uh, that January the sixth nonsense? I've never seen know. anything so staged in all my life. No. So all they're basically why? Why are the BBC doing that? Shouldn't that in that like MI6 kind of? Well, it is MI6. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's it? the thing. It is MI6, isn't it? The BBC is the intelligence services. That's the whole point. That's the that's the thing that has st jumped out in the um, all the podcasts that we've done about the, that Huxley Brave New World Order. All these people are all intertwined with the CIA. So why should why should she be any different? And it seems that the BBC's uh, Ministry of Truth mouth, mouthpiece there, Spring and all the other people there, um, funded by the government, funded by the taxpayer, just to spy on us and, and basically attack us. They're now the de facto disinformation experts, which again, that term itself, you'd have thought was an intelligence operation, just a disinformation expert would work for the intelligence operation. It is an intelligence operation, but it's done on TV, which is weird. Yeah. And it's telling it's, you that they're doing it. That's that's the strange thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, I suppose and, they want to warn people not to be a conspiracy theorist, don't they? That's that's yeah. the idea. Scare suppose. people off, don't they? Scare people that, off, yeah. But they just they want to scare people from actually going down the road that all those uh, far right traitors have gone down. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm obviously a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, but I got I got in because they measured the circumference of my nostrils, and apparently they were small enough for me to. Enroll. If, you, if she comes after us, I'm going to play at race car. Yeah, I'm going to play at race car. I'm going to pull my bottom lip down and show that Pirelli sign on my bottom lip saying inflate to £30. Um, anyway. Someone put in the comments, humour will bring these down. Sorry, I didn't yeah. catch the name. But I, I agree. 100%. Yeah, I do as well. Need yeah. to laugh at, that's what we were, we're going to say about doing cartoons of them. I know yeah. it sounds it's, it's, tri it's trivial and small, but we need to laugh at these idiots, don't we? We need to laugh yeah. at the ridiculous scenario that they're doing an MI6 operation on BBC. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. it's insane. Yeah, it, it, well, it's just insanity, isn't it? All of it's insanity. Um, and it's interesting to use the word fact. Um, I think we said this in one of the podcasts. Um, I won't go into this a lot, but a fact is not the truth. It's just a, a group of evidence that they put together to try and prove the truth. And I mean, I put here as an example, ask the Birmingham Six whether facts were the truth. You know that. Um, this is all oh, the invasion of Iraq. They were facts. That, that wasn't the truth. So, so anything that can be proven, which again doesn't mean it's the truth. It just means that you've either got more money or more power to prove that that other person hasn't, uh, and then you're guilty. Hmm. So, if you own a TV network, you can prove a person in the street is guilty of something. And that picture there, which we're going to come on to, was one of the early fact-checking pictures, actually, because that was done by a fact-checking company um, owned by a very wealthy um, French family. What's that picture of? That's the picture of, or one of the pictures, I'll, I'll do the next one as well. That's one of the pictures in Wuhan that they were saying that people were lying in the street dead. Is that a person there, you think? I, I don't know. I don't know, but... It, when they fact-checked it, what, what was the outcome? The fact-check is that, the, well, there's one person, so they were making out that everyone were dropping dead from uh, 91 Divock in mm. the streets. And, you know, the, the fact the fact-checking company is, is owned by a massive... In fact, the company we mentioned them, Matt Sergio mentioned them on the second summer of love, Vivende, that are part of Universal Studios. Right. So, Universal, the company that owns owned Universal Studios, or part of this, is uh, got a fact, its own fact checking company. But they they must have had a, a stronger strain of it in Wuhan for it to not. Well, they were closer of. to the bats, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. I suppose as it as it spread out and just like yeah, yeah vaporized that vaporized green smog bit. that went yeah. everywhere. Um, from, you know, from those planes that were spraying stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So, how many fact-checking companies are there? Um, I'll put that on, but I'll move on from that, otherwise we'll be here all night. How many fact-checking companies are there in the world? And I was quite surprised, actually. Um, for, this is from Wikipedia. The list of fact-checking websites includes websites that provide fact-checking services about both political and non-political subjects. The Reporters Lab at Duke University maintains a database of fact-checking organisation, organisations that is managed by Mark Stencil and Bill Adair. So, there are a hundred non-partisan organisation 
fact checking organisations around the world. A hundred. They need a hundred fact checking companies around the world. Mm. The labs the lab's inclusion criteria are based on whether the organisation examines all parties on all sides, examines discrete claims and reaches conclusions, tracks political promises, and is transparent about sources and methods, discloses funding and affiliations, which we will come on to. Uh, they do disclose them, but as we know, the people that are funding them and the people that are behind them are the very same people that were pushing all the nonsense in the first place. And whether its primary mission is news and information. So in the UK, there are several fact-checking companies. Um, BBC Reality Check, which is part of that nonsense that Spring does. There's Fact Check Northern Ireland, or Fact Check NI, the first independent dedicated fact-checking service for Northern Ireland, launched in 2016. Uh, the Fact Check blog, um, which is based around Channel 4 News, and Ferret Fact Check Service, uh, <laughs> Scotland's first fact-checker, launched in April 2017 after a grant from Google. So Google News Initiative, or Digital News Initiative, funded Ferret Fact Service. Isn't it funny that they, uh, they start to crop up in 2016-17? Yeah, just to get warmed up, Chris. Just to get warmed up. <laughs> just um, do a bit of shadow boxing. <laughs> so the two, the two big boys... Uh, in in Britain are full fact uh, and logically. I never heard of logically. I've heard of full fact, but I never I never heard of uh, logically. Uh, and what I'm going to do is go into two of the of these these full fact and logically, and just show how um, they're funded, who's behind them, etc etc and uh, it's quite interesting we're quite interesting as it all it always is uh, so the guy that founded them is this guy called lyric jean or jane j-a-i-n yeah beautiful hair um yours used to look it, like that yeah mine used to look like, like that i used to look like a pasadena <laughs> you, you <wish>. <laughs> rocking <laughs> jeff um look he founded logically in 2017 and it's actually based in brighouse chris right the right. Yorkshire Company, eye for an eye, and Jack all know where that is, with offices in London, uh, Bangalore, and Virginia. Where where's the CIA based again? Um, on Wikipedia, it said he's partly in, he was partly inspired by his grandmother's turn to misinformation before she died of pancreatic cancer. Apparently, a WhatsApp group that spread misinformation led her to replace her medication in favour of unproven alternative treatments. He also disliked the spread of misinformation in Britain around the time of Brexit uh, and the referendum. On uh, their bio on logically.co.uk or logically.com, Lyric, it said, Lyric is an entrepreneur, an engineer, who founded Logically in 2017 after observing the breakdown in public discourse during the 2016 US presidential election so there's a lot of reasons why they say he set, set this up. Um, that here little, he is having a little, podcast little. with our friend Robo Musk. I don't know who that other guy is, but and his lovely hair. Uh, I think it's a, a TED a TEDx thing. He's been on TEDx as well. He first began identifying opportunities for early interventions during his time at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and is motivated by the impact logically can deliver through human-machine collaborations to mitigate risks posed by information disorder. Logically now works with governments, businesses, and platforms around the world to uncover and address harmful misinformation and deliberate disinformation. So from 2017 to 2020, he started working with government. Because that always happens, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So I just, I just want to point out that um, MIT is funded um, by f government agencies like DARPA. Um, and he got an MIT grant uh, to set the business up. And it, InQtel also fund uh, MIT and for, so they can invest in technology businesses 
at seed level, at ground level, basically. Yeah. And and then they go on to get more, uh, raise more money. And in, in 2019, um, it raised £7 million just before 2020. The year before 2020, it raised £7 million. These companies like InQtel, InQtel, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of InQtel in the chat, but InQtel um, was founded by a guy called Norman uh, Augustine, and he's a member of the Atlantic Council, Council on Foreign Relations, he had a uh, Homeland Security Advisory Council, and he's also he was also president of Lockheed Martin, and he founded InQtel, which was part of, the, it's part of the CIA, it's the CIA's venture capitalist arm. Right. Yeah. The co-founder was a guy called, um, so these are the guys here. So that's the uh, Norman Augustine. This is the other co-founder, Gilliam Lewis, Gilman Lewis. Uh, he's a technology, technology venture capitalist and a CIA agent who got his start as a video game designer. This is the guy we're talking to you about, Chris. And then co-founded and ran the CIA, CIA venture capital fund in QTEL. He served on a number of boards, including Wizards of the Coast, Niantic, Total Entertainment Network, FSA Interactive. They're all um, tech companies, these. Uh, I'm not going to go on and say any more. These companies are all funded by the CIAs in QTEL. I couldn't find out whether um, Logically was funded by them. But, I mean, all these tech companies, they they basically funded hundreds of different ones. They wouldn't have been able to list them all anyway. Uh, there were that many that they, um, that they funded. And in QTEL... It funded a hundred million pounds worth of seed investments a year. Sorry, dollars uh, from the CIA into these universities. Hundred million pounds a year. Hundred twenty, sorry, million dollars a year um, of seed investment for people who were going to university, get the degree, come up with a business idea. A bit like the Facebook thing. Mm. So yeah, early funding was uh, is provided within. The corporate group within all these by Sony um, as well, you know, so they get involved with companies as well as just being the CIA is what I'm trying to say. I think they've made 350 investments um, since the setup in, since uh, 2006. So he, he invented flight simulators uh, for Google Earth. Right. That guy on the right hand side there, and a guy called Michael Crow. He's chairman of the board for InQtel, um, and he's part of the CIA as well. So anyway, I'm just saying that's where a lot of these firms get their funding from. In 2020, Logically raised another 2.77 million. Uh, and as of 2020, Logically had 100 employees. So from 2017, yeah, no start, now it's got 100 employees. I mean, that's some rapid growth, that, for a company that doesn't make any money. Hmm. Uh, logically helped the Guardian disprove claims of uh, the new technology on the new uh, masts, which I'm not going to mention, uh, that was connected to the arm spears. Uh, so it disinformation that. In 2021, it also began selling its services to governments and NGOs. The company claimed its software can categorise disinformation narratives as they are being woven. Logically is one of many companies hired by TikTok, uh, and works that curtail disinformation on social network. The New Yorker noted its tracking of disinformation re related to healthcare and the 91 Divock uh, nonsense. The BBC has also used and cited Logically's research in tracking the rise of pro-Russian accounts linking Ukraine to Nazi ideology. So the BBC in the two, 2010s actually did documentaries on the Nazis in Ukraine, and then they use logically to claim, to prove that it wasn't true. How does that right. work, anyway? In 2020, it logically raised uh, another, just under three million from Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund and XTX Ventures. As of 2020, it logically had only 100 employees, now it has 200 plus. So within space of, what did I say, 20, uh, 2017, it's got 200 plus employees, Chris. You get, you get the strong impression <clears throat> that it's military and it's and we're the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Only a small part, yeah. You're right. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, you, that, you don't fund something like that, right? And it doesn't work. No, it, it was never going to fail, was it? No, we can't so, fail. You, in my idiocy, right? So they were set up, like you say, like Facebook and stuff, and then all of a sudden, they start working for governments. Is that right? Yes, right. just like Facebook and Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Amazon has uh, some of the servers. Uh, the CIA uses the servers. I wonder what for. To, maybe to buy stuff. Uh, <clears throat> well, I remember some time ago. Bouncy castles I, or something. I think I bought a Kindle Fire. Fire and he yeah. started asking me, and we're going back quite a few years here, he started asking me what books I'd, I'd liked or read. Da, 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 da. Mm. And uh, there were quite a few conspiratorial ones in there. Then all of a sudden he started asking me about these like Muslim extreme books, if I liked them. I always thought that was quite odd. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like they were trying to link the fact I bought some conspiratorial books, and I think I played around with it a little bit as well. To be fair, well, imagine the information that it's gathering. I mean, we spoke about this in recording the other night. The data that they gather these places. Mm. Uh, anyway, these these investment companies, like the Northern Powerhouse Powerhouse Investment Fund, uh, and I've heard of, I've heard of them from my business times uh, uh, as five hundred million pounds worth of funding from the UK government, the European Regional Development Fund, the British Business Bank, and the European Investment Bank, which is a World Economic Forum partner. So them four entities there have put money into the MP, the Northern uh, Powerhouse Investment uh, Fund, and then they've invested in logically. So you can see the distance that they put between themselves. Mm. You don't directly see them. In, it just looks like Northern Powerhouse has invested in them. When in reality, there's all these other entities behind them that are actually um, investing in it, really. To summarise, uh, I would say, logically, looks like a CIA front, at least a CIA. Now it's got British and British investment and European investment, you'd actually say it's probably European intelligence service as well. But there is certainly something there for it to be allowed to collate all this data. It's basically mining data, isn't it? Mm. And changing people's opinion. So it, it, it were apparently set up because he were worried about disinformation. Now it's blocking truth. Yeah, and the poor, the little emotional story about his grandma or his mother, whatever. Yeah. Well, maybe some of that's true, and that's what sets them off. But this, he maybe got corrupted further down the line, or what have you. But um, yeah, um, he might, he might him, think he's doing a good thing. He might think he's doing a good thing. Um, <laughs> in June 2020, the International Fact Checking Network <laughs> certified log logically as a fact checker. The certification. So now you need to be certified as a fact checker, Chris. <laughs> you can't just become a fact checker. Uh, Maybe we uh, should go for one and get a little certificate behind us. Well, I got my uh, Tufty one when I was swimming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so now you're going to be certified as a fact checker, and it was renewed in 2021, and you'd be pleased to know it's been renewed in January 2023. Yeah, so they, they are they bona fide fact checkers now, Chris. If there's truth, you don't need anyone to check any facts, do you? Of course you do. You need facts. <laughs> I mean, look at the weather, right? You need that checking, don't you? Yeah, well, I didn't I didn't mean the, the weather, obviously, you need to check, because you can't just look out your window and see that it's pissing it down. No, no. Uh, or, or why do you care? Why do things, you care? Things are going on somewhere else. So, and... so that spun me off in, who is the International Fact Checking Network? Well, the International Fact Checking Network is actually called Pointer, the Pointer Institute for Media Studies, which is a non-profit, non-partisan journalism school and research organisation in Florida, in the U.S., the school is the owner of the Tampa Bay Times new newspaper and the International Fact Checking ne Network. Non for profit, Chris. Nice little upside down style logo. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's just a non for profit, Chris, and yeah. it's bipartisan. It doesn't, you know, it owns a newspaper, but just put that to one side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just put that to one side. Ignore that bit. Set up by media moguls Nelson and Henrietta Pointer. They met when they were both working for President Franklin de Roosevelt and his re-election campaign in 1940. They collaborated on a number of projects for the US Office of War Information. During World War II, she was the Assistant Program Chief for the Voice of America that established several overseas branches and launched a large-scale information and propaganda campaign abroad. They're, they're looking after the facts, Chris. Mm. Someone this organisation <laughs> founded on fantastic firm beliefs of facts and truth. <laughs> Either way, the two founders of the Pointer 
Institute of Media Studies, Nelson and Henrietta, both long dead now, worked for the na- a named militari- militarised propaganda broadcast, and their institute, na- institute now runs the International Fact Checking Network. The Pointer Institute for Media Studies also operates PolitiFact. PolitiFact.com is an American non-profit project. <laughs> PolitiFact. <laughs> <laughs> There's the Pointer Institute. I mean, the, you, you can check all this stuff. Um, it's, I mean, it's, is it interesting? I don't know. But it's interesting to know behind who who the people are behind these. Uh, I like the motto of it. Democracy needs journalism. Journalism needs pointer. <laughs> Just a pointer in the right direction. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I've got two pointers. <laughs> um, yeah, um, it's in 2015. The institute launched the International Fact Checking Network (IFCN), which sets a code of ethics for fact checking organisations. Yeah, they need some ethics. <laughs> yeah, they need some ethics. But what I don't understand is, so let's just say you set a fact-checking company up in Nigeria, for argument's sake, or anywhere in the world, why would you need to get a certificate from somebody from Florida? <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it works, isn't it? It's the same as the medical industry, anything. You know, you need a, yeah. you need a certificate. You need, you need a, an acclamation telling you that it's all right for you to do it. And if not, you're not all right to do it. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the I, I, IFCN reviews fact-checkers for compliance um, the issues and issues a certification to publishers who pass the audit. Compliance. Certification, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the certification lasts for one year, and fact-checkers must be re-examined annually with some rubber gloves. <laughs> 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 to, and, uh, is, is that annually or annually? Uh, <laughs> to retain their certificates. Google, Facebook, and other technology companies use IFCN's certification to vet publishers and fact-checking contracts, and for fact-checking contracts. Pointer receives funding from corporations, philanthropic organisations, and government agencies. <laughs> but, but, Chris, but it, it's, it's right in the middle. It doesn't, it doesn't sway either way, but it gets all its funding from the same organisations that we talk out about that it's fact checking against, and there's a list of them on on there. As you can see, second one down, Bill and Melvin's uh, Gates's Foundation. Um, th- th- these are just a few. There's TikTok, there's Abidia Networks, Open University, Lumina. Um, yeah, anyway, this Google. I don't. I don't want to point out the obvious, but <clears throat> when you when we're living in a world of absolute bullshit, and the media yeah. just talks absolute bullshit, you need fact checkers, don't you? You do. You just need the only fact time you need them, isn't it? When yeah. Everything's a lie. Yeah. I know I'm part of the obvious, but... Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you need them. You do yeah. need them then. So we're coming to the next one. Uh, full fat. I keep calling it full fat. And carry on calling it full fat. Um, another company, forward slash charity, NGO, who gained the International Fact Checking Network certification is Full Fact. In March 2017... Uh, the International Fact Checking Network was certified, uh, sorry, it certified Full Fact as an official fact checker. So yeah. who is Full Fact? Their motto is, <laughs> I like this, bad information ruins lives. It promotes hate, damages people's health, and hurts democracy. That's catchy, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> just, rolled off, just rolled off my tongue out my rubble lips. Tagline. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Described as an independent, independent. <laughs> when they use that word, yeah. one thing you know they're not is independent. Is independent. Described as an independent fact-checking organisation based in the UK, which aims to promote accuracy in public debate. Launched in two thousand nine, the word independent needs fact-checking itself. I think this is another one of those uh, words um, where independent, the actual meaning is. Free from outside control, not subject to another's authority, uh, not depending on another's um, money of whatever for their livelihood or, subsist- or subsistence. Full Fact was founded, as I said in 2009, by philanthropists Michael Samuel and Will Moy. Full Fact has 18 staff as of 2019 and is now 
It was set up as a company initially, but now it's a registered charity. Charity? Yeah, it's a charity. This is Will Moy. Um, he was the ex-chief executive of Full Fact. Um, and I, I tried listening to a few of his talks, but I couldn't get... I want to walk, how do you, um, put you through it. How do but, you get these jobs? How do you get... <laughs> well, we're going to uh, sort of... Uh, have a conversation about that. Will Sir, if you look at people's, sometimes when you look at the backgrounds, you get a picture of how they've sort of got into these positions. Uh, mm. He served on advisory groups for the Economic and Social Research Council, the ESRC, also on uh, groups like Ofcom, the Pew Charitable Trust, and the UK Treasury, and regularly gives evidence to select committees and other inquiries. He has also advised the Office of National Statistics on a communications review. Before full fact, Will worked in the House of Lords for non-party affiliated peer Lord Lowe of Dalston and for the Parliamentary Advisory Council on Transport Safety. The Economic and Social Research Council, formerly the Social Science Research Council, is part of the UK Research and Innovation, UKRI. It provides funding and support for research and training in social sciences. It is the UK's largest organisation for funding research on economic and social issues. And we've mentioned, we've come across this one before, and I think in, way back in Chris Whitty's uh, thing, a po podcast we did, and in a few of the other ones, these government bodies that nobody's ever heard of, they've got literally billions to throw about. Mm -hmm. And people like this guy, faceless individuals, then go on to open up these offshoot charity type organisations, think tanks or whatever, that we don't know nothing about. I mean, let's, a lot of these people, like him, when you hear, hear him talk, he's obviously not comfortable in front of a camera. It's like they've been thrown into a, in, into this mm. position. Normally they'd be under a rock somewhere running these companies and nobody would ever, ever hear of them, would they? Mm. But because people look into them, they, um, you know, they, they end up at the forefront and they don't look comfortable. Um, what, what I found interesting about this uh, this e, e what was it ESRC Economic Social Research Funding is that it was set up in 1981. Uh, the Education Secretary Sir Keith Joseph uh, asked Lord Rothschild to lead a review into the future of the SSRC. The social science is one of those branches of science devoted to study of societies and the relationships among individuals within those societies. Interestingly, again, this chap, and I'm not saying he worked for him, he didn't, but this chap here that Thatcher's next to, while she, w she was in power, anyway, Keith St. John Joseph, Baron Joseph, was a British politician, intellectual and barrister. He co-founded the Centre for Policy Studies, which we've also mentioned before, where a lot of these Tories go, and it's like that think tank where they all go and come out the other end. I think Zaha we went, and Cameron, and all these people there. Um, and I'm not Tory bashing, because I'm not Labour either, so I don't think I'm just Tory bashing. I've got no interest in any of these Normskis. I'm being polite there. Anyway, this Baron Joseph, he served as minister under four prime ministers, Harold Macmillan, Alec Douglas Holm, Edward Heath, and Margaret Thatcher. In 2014, Anthony Gilberthorpe, a Tory activist, failed parliamentary candidate, accused Joseph of being a a present at parties where sexual abuse of underage boys took place, along with naming others in the cabinet of the day. Gilberthorpe accused Joseph of being a paedophile. This guy here, though, who accused him, he was apparently supplying rent boys to these people. Right. These are these, I'm not saying this, this guy we're talking about, Wilmore, I'm not saying he's involved by a long shot. I'm saying the organisations, this is what they're built upon. Hmm. So he also worked for uh, the Pew Charitable Trust. And I'll, I'll just mention a little bit about this. Again, have you ever heard of the Pew Charitable Trust, Chris? No. Never heard of it. And these people have... The Pew Transport Tr Trust is a non-partisan public polling and think tank that operates as a subsidiary of the Pew Charitable Trust. Oh, sorry, the Pew Research Centre. And it, you, this works as a subsidiary of the Pew Tra Charitable Trust. 
Its budget is £374 billion, million pound, and it has an endowment of £6.7 billion. Pounds, dollars, sorry. Never even heard of it. No. And it's got six six and a half billion billion dollars for it to throw around. That's who these people work for. So this is the current uh, head of um, Full Fact. He's the interim chief exec, Andrew Dudfield. Um, while they're looking for a permanent replacement. Dudfield has led Full Fact's artificial intelligence team since 2019, developing technology to tackle to tackle misinformation at internet scale by serving the needs of fact checkers around the world. And it was previously the chief publishing officer of the Office of National Statistics, and prior to that spent a decade working in product and technology roles at the BBC. The door keeps revolving. <laughs> And no wonder the BBC used Full Fact. Full Fact offers staff three month secondments to statisticians working in the government statistical service. And so you can basically go from uh, full, full Fact into the government and their stat service. Yeah, run by this guy, Ian Diamond. Um, and he went to the London School of Economics. Uh, he was chi his chief executive of that cat. You know that the Economic and Social Research Council that I just mentioned, hmm. where that Will Moy worked. Um, no link there, and it's now part of the UK Research and Innovation Team, where Diamond is also a board member. So this Will Moy worked at both sides, and then he goes on to set Full Fact up. Yeah, where now they can second. Uh, staff to go and work for this guy again it's like a revolving door hmm. it's just a revolving door diamond's other report appointments so he's got another appoint other appointments uh, where he's the chairman of the research council uh, of the uk and vice chair vice chair uh, chancellor of the university of southampton which was also funding uh, funded by darpa and berners lee worked there tim berners lee um when they did the Facebook, when well, it was LifeLog at that point, um, research that went on to become Facebook. So the other, the other uh, full fact uh, co-founder was Michael Samuel. And it's an interesting link between uh, the two, how they, how they met. Um, Moy and Samuel were introduced by a lady called Julia Newberger. And began working together. Interestingly, Baroness Newberger, there she is, um, the daughter, a maiden named Schwab. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I can't make this stuff up if I wanted to. Um, uh, she's the daughter of art cricket, Liesl Alice, uh, and civil servant Walter Schwab. Julia married Professor Anthony Newberger, one of the brothers uh, is. David Edmund Newberger, or Baron Newberger, of Abbotsbury. He's an English judge. He worked at the Merchant Bank NM Rothschild and Sons from 1973. They, orig they originate from Bavaria. Baroness Newberger also attended the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2006. The, Sh the Schwab Trust, which supports and educates young refugees and asylum seek seekers, was later set up in her parents' name. I could have gone on deeper here, but I'm not going to go because I've got too much to go through. You see where that could be headed. Mm. So Michael Samuel, uh, seen there, um, is the younger son of Peter Samuel, the fourth Viscount of Bearstead. So he's the this guy's the co-founder of Full Fact, who was an executive of Shell, and his wife Elizabeth. Um, she was the daughter of Baron Cohen, a barrister and judge. Elizabeth Cohen, Cohen's paternal great-grandfather was financer uh, Lionel Lewis Cohen, the founder of Lewis Cohen and Sons, who were foreign bankers. Lewis Cohen served as a trustee and later manager of the London Stock Exchange. Michael Samuel, obviously educated at Eton. The Samuels are part of the Hill Samuel Banking Dynasty, which is now part of the Lloyds Banking Group. 
It was formerly a leading British merchant bank and financial services to, to, uh, firm. His brother Nicholas is the current Viscount Bearstead. Um, we'll come back to him in a, in a sec, actually. I want to come on to this one here. Michael Samuel is married to this lady here, next to Princess Diana. Um, Julia uh, Samuel, MBE. Julia is a philanthropist, psychotherapist and paediatric child counsellor. She's one of several godparents to Prince George. Julia Samuel is the daughter of James Guinness, a banker and his wife, the former Pauline Vivian Manda. Guinness is a member of the banking dynasty of the famous Guinness family, founders of the Guinness Mahon in 1836, which descends from Samuel Guinness. So these are the people behind um, Full Fact. <laughs> As we know, the Guinness family is an Irish family that are famous for their uh, ale. But they're also linked intrinsically to um, the uh, Rothschild family. The founder of the dynasty, Arthur Guinness, is confirmed to have had McCartan origins, or clan McCartans. They were lords of uh, parts of Ireland, kings of par parts of Ireland. French President Charles de Gaulle also comes from there, and I'm sure... There was a link there to George Orwell as well. But yeah, some of them founded the SAS. Uh, I think it, one of her, anyway, linked to the SAS. So yeah, you can see they're quite a heavily linked family. But his father was one of the heads of the Royal Dutch Shell Group, which was created in 1907 and was then bought by the Rothschilds. Hmm. Beginning to see a pattern, Chris? Hmm. Who's controlling all this stuff? So we come to funding. Who funds these freaks? So Full Fact has been sponsored to develop AI fact-checking tools by Amidia Network and Open Society Foundations. Amidia Network is a self-styled philanthropic investment firm composed of foundation and an impact investment firm. Impact, in, impact investing refers to investments made into companies organisation who fund with the intention to generate a measurable beneficial social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. That sounds good, doesn't it, Chris? Mm -hmm. Venture philanthropy is a type of impact investment that takes concepts and techniques from cap venture capital finance and business management the term was first used in 1969 by John D. Rockefeller III to describe an imaginative and risk-taking approach to philanthropy that may be undertaken by charitable organisations. So, from their own website, um, who funds um, who funds Full Fact? It says we're a registered charity, and the, and we're funded by people like you, by charitable trusts, and by other funders. We are committed to neutrality, independence, and transparency. So all donations greater than £5,000 are publicly available on our website. So this is one of the, these are a few of the funders here, and you can see that there's quite a lot of, this is, I think, what year was this? Uh, 2018, is it? Does it say? 2016. 2016, so... There's a few. There's a few of these. Uh, I didn't do them all, but it breaks them all down there. Um, Amidia Network was founded by uh, Peter Omidia. I mentioned him before, and his wife Pam. Um, Amidia Network has committed 1.5 billion dollars to non-profit uh, organisations uh, in that type of investment. Pierre Amidia was a young global leader in 1999. He's the 220th richest person in the world. He set up. Uh, eBay and is worth about nine billion dollars. Open Society Foundations, as we know, um, it was set up by George George Soros. I think it's got eighteen billion in it, or something like that. And Soros is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. His both his sons, Jonathan and Alexander, were U World Economic Forum Young Global Leaders. Other funders of Full Fact are Facebook, Google. Bally Gifford, if you've never heard of Bally Gifford, they're a massive hedge fund investment company. WhatsApp also fund them. I mean, you can just go on the website and have a look at who funds these people. Um, it's, it, 
you, you, if you wanted to make it up, you couldn't actually make it up. It was Nuffield that says that a few times. <clears throat> is that the is that that um, medical? Um, I would have thought so. I don't know. Health I didn't look into them all, Chris. Yeah. Um, so is full fact purely independent? Is it bollocks? It can't be, can it? If yeah. even by publishing them and saying they're open and honest, um, yeah. On January eleventh, twenty nineteen, it was announced that Full Fact will be providing fact checking services for Face Crook. Um, in on, in January twenty twenty two, Full Fact signed a letter of fact checkers calling YouTube to stop algorithms from suggesting videos of creators deemed to be spreading misinformation or disinformation. So th- this is who they are, you know. They're the. There's another one there. So we're going to come to the last one now. Um, I came across this quite by accident, actually. Um, when I was doing the Schwab, uh, first Schwab one I did, going back two years ago, um, people were saying to me Schwab were related to the Rothschilds because a Schwab married a Rothschild. Anyway, there's a website on a Jewish memorial website. And it it pops up, right? Because that many people has gone on to search it, whether Schwab related to this. I'm not mm. going to go into that because that's a different story. But the, they had a fact-checking uh, pop-up on the screen, and it was this fact-check, AFP.com. And it said that it, we fact-checked this, and this isn't true. Schwab, Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum isn't related to this anyway. I won't go into that bit because I think that's nonsense now. But any, not not that he's. I think he is related to him. But anyway, um, but is it interesting that that fact check thing? All it does is just say that's not true. Yes, <laughs> that's I, kind of all it does, isn't it? I, I have not come. Uh, well, I might There's be no wrong because I'm taking the right lot of notice. But have you ever known one that's come up and said, "Oh, that's true"? No, they're, <laughs> they're basically told to fact check things that they don't want to agree with. Mm. So, for instance. In the middle of the uh, nonsense, they, they, they were, the one I heard was them talking about, when they when were really going full throttle, talking about the uh, yellow card system, yeah. saying that you can't trust it. But yeah. it was created by the government, but it's not trustworthy. Yeah. So why do they need to fact check that? Well, yeah, why, why aren't they saying, it, right, it's not, you can't trust it because of X, Y, Z, mm-hmm. but the government, somebody at the government should be locked up in sorry, jail because that's oh, the oh, only sorry. thing that you can use. Yeah, I was sorting it out. Yeah. Um, so, fact check AFP.com. AFP stands for Agence France Presse, uh, a French international news agency headquartered in Paris. It's um, it's an interesting family behind this, the the, the Bollore family, and uh, it was founded in it was founded in 1835 as Havas. Um, it's the world old, world's oldest PR company and news agency. It's a French multinational advertising and public relations business. It operates in over 100 countries. I mean, if you're going to set up an intelligence network to operate in 100 countries, and it's one of the largest advertising and communication groups in the world with revenues around $3 billion. Avaz was a acquired in 1998 by Vivendi, renamed Vivendi Universal Publishing, um, which owned a lot of the dance music and the music that we were talking about in those Second Summer of Love. And it became uh, Editis in 2004. And it's now, in April 2022, Avas acquired UK-based digital agency and Google partner Search Laboratory. So these companies are buying all these businesses up. And this is the guy that heads this one, Yannick Bollari. Uh, he was a young global leader in 2008. Uh, he's currently the chairman and CEO of Avas, the fifth largest global comms company and chairman on of the super, super, supervisory board of Vivenda, a global entertainment media company. So he, his family... He's a shareholder in the family control Ballori Group, chaired by his brother, Cyril Ballori. And he was a young global leader as well. Um, so both brothers are young global leaders. And their father is the 
old man of the business, if you like, Vincent, and he was a young global leader in 1993 as well. He's a French industrialist, businessman, media owner, billionaire. His estimated worth is $10 billion, or the family's worth. Through his father, Michael, so the, the, these are on the French version, I suppose, of fact checkers, um, and the, they're own massive media companies as well. How, how, can, how can you be allowed to own a fact-checking company and also own newspapers, television companies and all the other stuff that you're actually fact-checking? How, how on earth can you be independent? You it's can't, like can you? Quagmire of bullshit there. Yeah. Yeah. So Bolero Group is a, a major shareholder in Universal uh, Music Group. And he's a, chair, he was a, he's a board member, I think, as well. And uh, he's a board member of Vivendi and Canal plus so that's another tv company through his mother uh, monique Follot, he descends from the goldschmidt family the goldschmidt family uh is is uh, of german descent originally from frankfurt known for their success in banking and finance the family is interwoven with the rothschild family the Bis bischoffenheim family and and the bartolome family one of the richest families of Monaco. Vincent started his career at the investment bank of, guess where, Chris? What? Edmund what? Rothschild. <laughs> That's two mentions already in two fact-checking companies. Hmm. In 1975, at the age of 23, a general meeting of Blog Group allowed Vincent and his brother Michael, or Michelle, to take equal control of the company uh, with their financier, Edmund de Rothschild. Vincent became a deputy director of Rothschild Bank. Bolaire, Bolaire uh, Company, the company Bolaire, was founded in 1822, and it's now got revenues of 24.84 billion as of 2019. His maternal grandmother was Nicole von Goldschmidt. Um, during World War II, she entered the secret services of Charles de Gaulle and the Free French in London, after the war, under cover of the Red Cross, she pursued a long career as a secret agent with French intelligence, notably as a liaison with her Israeli counterparts. <laughs> disinformation. Uh, she was a disinformation expert. Can you believe that, Chris? Uh, the influence of public opinion. Uh, anyway. So these are the people running these. I only picked three. Um, she was also close friends of Edmund de Rothschild and the parents of Antoine Barheim, former managing partner of Lazard Bank and the bank Lazard Banking Empire. Um, the English branch of the Goldsmiths, or the Goldsmiths, uh, and their anglicised name of Goldsmith, starting with Frank Goldsmith in 1878. Its most famous 20th century member was billionaire Sir James Goldsmith, rumoured to be the father of Princess Diana, a member of Le Circle. And now Zach Goldsmith, also known as Baron Goldsmith of Richmond Park. Goldsmith is married to uh, banking heiress Alice Rothschild. His uncle Teddy Goldsmith was an Anglo-French environmentalist, writer and philosopher. He co-authored the influential blue, a Blueprint for Survival. Uh, a founding mem he's a founding member of the political party People, later named Green Party. The Goldsmith family is directly tied to the Rothschilds. And as I said, the other massive uh, family, like the Bischoffenheim family, who were co-founders of the Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank, um, yeah, etc., etc., etc. I could go on and on and on. Um, th these people are well connected uh, beyond belief. So why why did I pick this one? Well, at the beginning, if you remember, uh, I mentioned that this AFP came up with the uh, first images of the people lying in the street in Wuhan. FP journalists, journalists, uh, these two guys, these guys here, Leo Ramirez, Hector Retamal and Sebastian Riese were the source of one of the first propaganda stories starting uh, the scare campaign of 91 Divok. Um, reporting from Wuhan, China, they allegedly, on January 30th, took a photo showing a man wearing a face mask cycling past an elderly man who had died on the pavement near a hospital in Wuhan. The photo and story were published by The Guardian 
on January 31st, 2020. Fat checking. <laughs> fat checking, Chris. So they're saying that's true. They're saying it's real. Well, the fat checking. Well, the fat checking company, a- AFP fat checking website, put it out. Put it out. <clears throat> Mad, isn't it? The power of a photo. Power of a photo. Yeah. I mean, nobody has a clue. If that's real, staged, what it is, whatever it is. Just put two guys in hazmat suits next to a guy lying down and you've got it, haven't you? You've got it. That's all you've you got need. it. Yeah. Guy we're riding past on his bike aimlessly. This is the Ministry of Truth, isn't it, on a scale yeah. that you can't even put into words. Yeah. 100 fact-checking companies around the world, 100 all churning out shite. All churning out shite. It's uh, you a scary right. world. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon? You all right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, anything you want to add to that, Chris? No, uh, no, I don't know. We're coming to the end there, really, of uh, the show. It was uh, I thought it'd take about an hour to go go through that. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Sorry, you had to put up with that um, thirty-minute video. <laughs> <laughs> it is painful. It is painful watching watching that. But I think we've got to put this stuff down um, and call these people out because mm. these people need calling out. It needs documenting and putting down not just the vi- thirty-minute video, but this fact-checking stuff because. All the same people are behind it. When you look at who's behind um, the institutions, all the um, pharmaceutical companies, you've got BlackRock and all these other people, the same people are just behind everything. They're Mm. funding all sides, aren't they? Mm. Yeah. The corruption corruption runs deep. Well, to them, it isn't even corruption, Chris. That's the thing, isn't it? No. No, it's just um, covering all angles, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. Any... The next bullshit story that comes up. Yeah, the next bullshit story. All right, well, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i put this out on uh, on Saturday. As I said, there won't be a live one on Saturday. You're jetting off anyway for a few days, aren't you? Yeah, I'm going to Spain. Yeah, you're going to Spain till next yeah. Saturday. Yeah. Mrs and child are already over there with their family. Yeah, you're stay, st- staying out away. I'm home alone for a week, and then I'm going over there for a week. <laughs> home, alone. <laughs> home alone in his vest. <laughs> Getting lots of allotment done, lots of sculpting done. Yeah. Yeah. All right then, guys, in the chat, thanks for coming coming and listening to us uh, on this bullshit platform. I didn't have much to do in that one, did I? No, no you didn't yeah. have much. You just come in, drink wine, yeah. smile. Smoke, st- stare gormlessly at the screen. <laughs> yeah, no one knew there. <laughs> Enjoy the sangria, uh, anti-Covid says. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward. I've not. I've actually not been abroad for over three years. Since this, four, nearly four years. I, I came back in. Well, I went to Vietnam to see Seb, um, my son who sings this huge farm tune. Mm. Um, and I came back on January two thousand and twenty. Opened up a metro coming back from London to Cambridge, and I, I remember it said he had a, a story about. And I was. I, I remember looking at it and thinking. Oh, more bullshit. But then I had this flashback when I was on the plane, because it was a long haul flight. I was sat there and there was a couple next and I sneezed. And this couple next to me um started rummaging around in the bags and put masks on. And I remember thinking, it's a bit rude. And I yeah. bear in mind, I've been in an island in Vietnam, I'd not heard anything about it. And it was yeah. what? Beginning of January. End of January, sorry, 2019. Uh, 2020. And um I just came back to a wave of shite. <laughs> Weird. Weirdness. First, never ne- never take off anywhere that ninety one Divock stuff. Yeah. Never take off. That was my no, first reaction fire. That, that no one will ever come of it. No one will ever come of it. Interesting. Yeah. Okay then we'll check out. See you next time. Take it easy. See you next time. Bye. Bye.
be.